Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm finally back after three whole years. I'm three years older and a million years wiser. It's been a crazy three years and I'm so happy to be back. I wanna thank everyone who reached out to me asking where the hell I was and when I was going to make videos again because you guys are the reason why I really am happy to be back and doing this. Honestly, I started questioning if I should even continue to do these videos where conspiracy theories went from being sort of this fun alien Bigfoot thing to this politicized, dangerous, scary thing that just turned into something I didn't know if I wanted to be associated with anymore. But I'm back and I'm ready to get into today's story. Lorencia Ann Bambenek was born on August 15th, 1958, making her a Leo. She was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she was the youngest of three girls. Lori's mother and father were blue collar type. Her father was a former Milwaukee police officer, but he decided to leave the department after witnessing some corruption and he became a carpenter. Her mother was a stay at home mom and was said to be always very well put together. Lori was closest with her father. Lori was raised Catholic, but she was sort of known to always challenge authority from a very young age. She graduated high school in 1976 and she went on to college where she earned her degree in fashion merchandising management. After college, Lori sort of was trying to find her way. She started working in retail for a while and then she did some modeling. She actually was a calendar girl. She was Miss March for a local beer calendar. Lori was a very beautiful woman, but she didn't want to just rely on her looks. She wanted to do something that meant something. So when she was 21, she decided that she actually wanted to become a police officer. And before we get further into that part of Lori's life, I'm going to touch base a little bit on the Milwaukee Police Department at the time. At the time, the chief of police in Milwaukee was a man named Harold Breyer. He was said to be a very strict law and order type of chief. He had his officers carry their weapons on and off duty. He wanted them to have it on them at all times. He had a morals clause for all his officers that said they were not to have sex outside of marriage. And his department had this reputation. They were notorious for intimidating and harassing citizens, especially minorities. And unfortunately, a lot hasn't changed in the Wisconsin police departments, as we all know. The reputation of the local police department became so extreme that the federal government actually got involved. They said that his department needed to represent its citizens more and have female officers as well as minorities. Otherwise, they were going to lose funding. So Harold was led to put out an ad in the paper that requested females and minorities to apply in the department. And that's where Lori decided that she wanted to become an officer. She saw the ad and decided that this would be a good journey for her. She especially wanted to help sexual assault victims. Lori immediately said she found herself in what felt like a boys club. There were 45 men and 11 women at the academy and she said that they just immediately treated the women differently and they gave her the nickname Bambi right away, which she hated. It was said that Lori could outrun all of the men in training and that she often spoke up to her superiors when she wasn't supposed to and that she questioned why there weren't any women in high ranking positions. So right away she was pissing these guys off. They were treating the women in such a way that it was very obvious they were being forced to hire them. They were even very strict about the women's hair. They weren't allowed to just tie it in a bun like a lot of other police departments allowed them to. They were actually required to cut all their hair off like super short short. And Lori actually found a way around this. She decided that she would just tuck in her long hair into a short wig. Love that for her. And keep this in mind because the wig will come up later in the story. Lori graduated from the academy in 1980 and was assigned to the MPD's Southside District. In her autobiography, Woman on the Run, Lori claimed that the MPD was composed of brutal, lazy, apathetic, and corrupt police officers. It wasn't long before Lori started noticing corruption with the MPD. She was taking notes and paying close attention. Among the things she witnessed were drinking on the job, meeting up with mistresses and school squad cars, selling pornographic films from the trunk of their cars, selling and doing drugs, using excessive force, and paying informants with drugs. Lori was the type that worked hard and played harder. 
And she was very open with her sexuality. She was kind of a flirt. So one time she went to an after work party at one of the officer's house and she was wearing sort of a low cut shirt. And one of the officer's wives said something about it to her, kind of accusing her of flirting with her husband and being a floozy, like, oh, your shirt's so low, you know? The woman came up to Lori and she's like, I saw the way my husband was looking at you in that low cut shirt. And Lori was sort of like, you know, get lost, you're drunk. And it was sort of this brief encounter. But after that, it was said that there was an anonymous tip that Lori was smoking marijuana at that party, and she would later be investigated. Nothing really ever became of the investigation, but Lori said after that incident, the other officers started to treat her a lot differently. So now I'm going to introduce another character in this story. Her name is Judy Zess. She was another female officer on the MPD and a friend of Lori's. One night in May of 1980, Judy and Lori attend a concert together. They're out having fun, minding their own business, but Judy ends up getting busted by an off-duty officer for smoking a joint. Lori unfortunately gets end up being put in this position where she has to write a report about her friend because she was a witness at the event. Lori tries to protect her friend by lying on the statement saying that Judy wasn't smoking, but this ends up being discovered later on and Lori is let go from her job in August of 1980. It really seemed like the MPD was just looking for reasons to fire the female and minority officers. I mean, they're out enjoying themselves at a concert and an off-duty officer just happens to be there right in the vicinity of Judy and Lori. I mean, come on. Out of the 11 female officers that were hired with Lori's squad, eight of them would end up being fired, three within one week. Lori was determined to get the news out about the MPD and how they were just trying to get rid of the female officers and the minorities in the department. So after she is fired from the MPD, Lori comes across some scandalous photos of the MPD officers. The men were pictured naked dancing on picnic tables in the park. Lori ends up taking these photos to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commissions, telling them that she was wrongfully fired for a minor infraction and that these officers are out there doing stuff like this and what can they do to help her? These photos proved that officers were out there committing far worse infractions than she was and nothing was happening to them. So the EEOC encouraged Lori to file a discrimination report with the MPD's Internal Affairs Division. So after Lori is fired from the MPD, she actually gets a job working at the Playboy Club in Lake Geneva. She also, around this time, starts getting threats in the form of written notes, and she also got a dead rat put on the hood of her car. The MPD did not like that she had reported them and that she had in her possession these nefarious photos of them naked at the park. And right around this time, Lori meets a man named Fred Schultz. Fred is a 13-year veteran of the MPD. In her memoir, Lori said, quote, I was drawn in by his overwhelming personality. He was manipulative, consuming, but he was also the life of any party he went to. Fred Schultz was recently separated from his wife, Christine, and they had two sons together, two little boys. So Christine remained in their house on the south side of town, and she actually started a new relationship with another MPD officer named Stu Honick. Stu and Fred were actually friends, and after Christine and Fred had separated, Fred was sleeping on Stu's couch. So Fred wasn't very happy about Stu having a relationship with his ex-wife. Fred was paying Christine $700 a month in alimony, which would be about $2,200 today. He was giving her so much money that he couldn't really afford a place of his own. He was sharing an apartment with Lori and two other roommates at the time. Lori and Fred were married very quickly. They actually married in January of 1981, and there were rumors flying around that Lori must have been pregnant. Why else would she marry him so quickly? Fred and Christine had just gotten a divorce that November. But Lori said, absolutely not. I married him for his vasectomy. <laughs> Lori had no interest in having children at the time and she was a self-proclaimed feminist. She kept her last name when they were married. So now we are in early 1981 and let's kind of reestablish where we're at here. We have Lori and Fred newlyweds, living in an apartment together. They have two roommates, one of them being the female officer that was Lori's friend, Judy Zess, and Lori's boyfriend at the time named Thomas. Thomas was said to be the sort of hardcore 80s bodybuilder type, and he was also a drug dealer. And then on the other side of town, we have Christine living in the house with the two boys, 
dating Fred's ex-friend, Stu Honick. The situation with Lori, Fred, and their two roommates didn't last very long because Judy was a partier and she threw a big party one night and ended up getting them all evicted. After that, Lori would get a job as a campus security officer at the Marquette University in Milwaukee, and her and Fred got their own apartment together. So now that I've introduced you to this cast of characters and gave you a little bit of background, we're going to jump right in to the night of the murder, which is May 28th, 1981. Christine Schultz, Fred's ex-wife, would have a relatively normal Thursday afternoon. She spent the day gardening and Stu, her boyfriend, came over to help her and she made him and the boys dinner and Stu ended up going home that night around six o'clock. That night, the two boys would end up sleeping in one room together because one of them was said to have had a nightmare and around 2 a.m. someone enters the home. Sean, the oldest son, hears someone enter the room and he said he felt something around his neck, possibly a rope, and hands over his nose and mouth. The younger brother Shannon then tried to defend his brother against a man which he described as a tall man with a reddish ponytail, a green jumpsuit, and black shoes. The man then gives up on the boys and runs down the hall to Christine's room. The boys remain in their room and they hear their mother say something like, please don't do that, and they hear something that sounds like a firecracker. The boys then run to their mother's room and they find the man standing over Christine. He then flees the scene and the boys try to wake up their mother, but unfortunately it is too late. Christine is laying in the bed with a cord wrapped around her left hand, a gag in her mouth, and a scarf around her head, and she had been shot. The boys then call Stu for help. Stu calls the MPD, and they immediately arrive to the scene. Fred, who was also on duty that night, gets the call and immediately arrives at the Schultz residence. David Kane, who was an officer at the scene, would later say that he was instructed by the inspector to immediately remove Christine's body from the house because he didn't want it in there with the two young boys. David thought that this was very odd and unorthodox. The investigators reported that there was a purse on Christine's nightstand with cash still in it and a safe that had been left open with an empty metal box inside. So one could assume that whoever broke into the house knew what was in the safe and immediately went for the safe and left her purse alone or it could have already been open. The safe could have already been opened by Christine. So that night, Lori is at home by herself. She was supposed to go out to the club with her friends, but she was very tired from recently moving into her apartment. She gets a call around 2.45 in the morning from Fred telling her that Christine had been shot and killed. She immediately calls up one of her best friends and her friend said she was screaming hysterically saying, Christine's been shot, Christine's been killed. A few hours later, around 6.30 in the morning, Fred and his partner, Michael Durfee, arrive to Lori and Fred's apartment. Fred and Lori talk in private for a little bit and then Fred went to retrieve his off-duty gun from his dresser drawer which was a Smith & Wesson five-shot two-inch revolver with a blue handle. Fred handed the gun to his partner to inspect to see if it had been recently fired. His partner concluded that the gun had not been recently fired. He said it was dusty and there was no carbon residue and there was no smell to indicate that it had been recently shot. However, Michael Durfee never wrote down the serial numbers of the gun and when he was later asked for the notebook with the description written down, from the report, he said that he lost the notebook. It wasn't long before police started to look at Lori as the main suspect. They found two blonde hairs at the crime scene and they sent an officer over to Lori's house to question her about that night. Lori allegedly said, why would I kill that bitch? Then I would have to take care of those two rugrats. While there, the officer that questioned Lori also retrieved the gun, Fred's off-duty gun, to have tested for ballistics. After which, it was discovered that it indeed was the murder weapon that killed Christine Schultz. So this was enough evidence. She was arrested for the crime on June 24th, 1981, almost a month after the murder of Christine. As soon as Lori was bailed out of jail, she gave an interview with the media saying that she is a feminist and she would never do this to another woman. She also alleged that her arrest was a retaliation by the MPD for her discrimination suit against them. The media went wild with this case. She immediately was referred to as Bambi Bambenic in the headlines. And and they kind of painted her to be this party girl who wanted Christine dead for the money. She was tired of her husband Fred having to pay Christine alimony and she wanted the house and the money all to herself. The prosecution pointed out that Lori was the only person with means motive and the opportunity to carry out this crime. She had access to the gun that night and she also had access to the key to the house and there was no sign of forced entry at the scene of the crime. For witnesses, the prosecution called to the stand a shop owner who accused Lori of stealing. He 
accused Lori of stealing a green jogging suit that matched the one that the killer had been wearing, according to Shannon and Shane. So at the scene of the crime, they had found the blonde hairs. They had also found hairs that matched wig fiber, and those were the red hairs. So another witness at the trial was a wig shop owner. And this wig shop owner accused Lori of purchasing a wig that exactly matched the wig that the killer had been wearing. The wig shop owner said that they specifically remembered that it was Lori because they remembered the check that Lori had written out. Lori denied this, of course, and it was later found out that Lori didn't even have a checking account. Another key witness was Lori's good old friend, Judy Zuss. Judy had since married her boyfriend, Tom, and Tom was actually arrested just a few weeks before Christine's murder. Judy testified stating that she did in fact own a green jogging suit, just like the one that the killer was wearing. She also said that Lori frequently talked about wanting Christine dead. She said, quote, it would pay to have Christine dusted, according to Judy. She said she was tired of living in an apartment while Christine got to live in the house and Fred had to give her all that money for alimony. And the smoking gun was that Judy testified Lori had owned that wig. Not only had she owned the wig, she had flushed it down the toilet. And this was proven because a wig was found in the pipes at her apartment after the plumber had been called for a clog. The prosecution also called to the stand a witness who said Lori had offered him money to carry out the murder of Christine Schultz. On March 9th, 1982, after four days of deliberation, Lori was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. She was only 23 years old. Fred would stand by Lori throughout the entire trial and he said that he would love her forever, but, forever lasted less than a year because Fred would eventually write Lori a letter saying, basically, good luck, it's over, I'm done. He would later publicly say that Lori was, quote, guilty as sin. And this led Lori to believe that Fred was actually involved in Christine's murder and possibly a murder for hire situation. So after Lori is sentenced, a few things come to light that help her case. One, Judy writes Lori a letter saying that she is so sorry that she testified against her and that she actually testified under duress and she wasn't telling the truth on the stand. Another is that one of Lori's old neighbors signs an affidavit saying that Judy knocked on her door one day asking to use her bathroom, after which her toilet was clogged and that was the clog that led to the plumber being called that led to the discovery of the wig. In 1983, Judy sat down with Lori's lawyer and confessed to falsifying her testimony. She also said that she was sleeping with one of the lead detectives on the case at the time. So if Lori didn't do it, then who? It was Lori's belief that the real killer was a man named Frederick Hornberger. Now stay with me because this gets topsy-turvy. After Judy's husband, Tom, was arrested, Judy Zess starts sleeping with this guy, Frederick Hornberger. It turns out that Frederick had an ulterior motive for sleeping with Judy. He heard that even though Tom had been arrested for drugs, that there were still some hidden in his apartment. So he thought by sleeping with Judy, he could get to those drugs. It's unclear if he ever found those drugs, but two weeks before Christine's murder, Judy would end up being attacked. One night while she was walking home, she was beaten up, threatened with a gun. She had a bandana stuffed in her mouth and she said her attacker was wearing a wig. Frederick Hornberger had a history of committing crimes, attacking and committing robberies, and you guessed it, a wig. Frederick Hornberger also knew the Schultz. He had worked on a remodeling project in their home, so he knew his way around the house. He would end up serving 10 years for the robbery and attack of Judy Zess, and his fellow inmates said that he would frequently brag about getting away with murdering Christine Schultz. Lori would have various journalists and investigators on her side fighting for her release. While in prison, she stayed hopeful. She started a newspaper in the prison, she got her bachelor's degree, and she even raised funds to get a salad bar. But she could not convince the courts to grant her an appeal. If you were going to kill someone, would you have known that the bullet could be traced to the gun? I was a cop, of course. Of course. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd throw it in the middle of Lake Michigan. You'd do anything but, but to, you know, use your husband's gun and bring it home. 
why don't you just put up a neon sign? I mean, that's crazy. One day in prison, she spotted a visitor, Dominic Giuliato, who she thought was really cute. So she asked his sister about him and the two became pen pals. They had mutual interest in each other and they actually fell in love. And six months later, Dominic would propose to Lori. Then Lori's third appeal was denied and her and Dominic had to think of a plan. They would devise a plan together for Lori to escape. So Dominic goes to the local cemeteries and he looks at gravestones of infants that have died. Infants that died around the time that he and Lori were born. He gets the names and dates of birth of these infants and uses them to create fake identities for him and Lori. On July 15th, 1990, eight years, four months, and five days into her life sentence, Lori escapes. She snuck out the laundry room window and climbed over the fence of barbed wire and Dominic would be waiting outside with their new identities as Jennifer and Anthony. They headed across the Canadian border to start their new life. Lori got a job as a waitress, they got an apartment, and everything seemed to be going well. But the media would turn out to be a double-edged sword. This case obviously went wild in the media. This young, attractive woman accused of murder, escapes from prison. She was on America's Most Wanted. While she gained sympathy for her case, her face was plastered all over the media, and everyone knew who Bambi was. There was even t-shirts made that said, Run Bambi Run. So it was only three months before Lori Lori was recognized by an American tourist and the Canadian police arrested her. She tried to gain status as a political refugee and the Canadian government did actually have sympathy on Lori. They would return Lori to the United States under the condition that her case be reviewed. So under the review of her case, it was discovered that there were some major blunders in the case. One being that Fred Schultz was allowed on the crime scene at all. The medical examiner not being called for 90 minutes. The incident of Fred's partner losing his notebook. So since Fred's partner never wrote down that serial number of the gun, there wasn't a any way to prove that the gun that the other officer retrieved from the house was the same gun that was looked at the night of the murder. So ultimately, Lori was granted a new trial and her fiance served a year in prison for helping her escape. Lori would spend seven months in solitary confinement and at her trial, she was offered a deal. If she were to plead no contest for second degree murder, she would be released on time served. She ended up taking the deal, but she did not stay out of the spotlight. She would appear on Oprah and Diane Sawyer and she even wrote her own book, Woman on the Run. There was also a TV movie made about her her. In her personal life, Lori did struggle. Obviously, this really derailed her whole life. She was only 23 when she was arrested. So she ended up moving to Vancouver, Washington to live with her parents, and she did struggle with alcoholism. Then in 2001, a new law in Wisconsin said that convicts that believed they were wrongfully convicted could apply for DNA testing. Lori decided that she wanted to do this, but she didn't want to do it in Wisconsin because she knew so many people there and so many people knew her. She wanted to do it with an out-of-state company privately, but in order to do this, she would have to pay for it. The state wouldn't pay for that to be done. Enter Dr. Phil, the devil himself. Dr. Phil agrees to pay for the testing done out of state if Lori will open the envelope on his show. So the production ends up putting Lori in this apartment before the filming of the show. There's no phone, no TV, no radio. She has no contact to the outside world. They said they did this so that she wouldn't be able to get access to the information before it was filmed on air. However, Lori had severe PTSD from being in solitary confinement all that time in prison and she panicked. She ended up tying her bed sheets together and trying to jump out the window, but sadly, she fell. Lori injured herself so badly that she ended up having to have her leg amputated. Her appearance on Dr. Phil was obviously canceled, but the DNA test found that there was zero connection to Lori to the crime scene of the murder of Christine Schultz. In 2005, Lori would marry a man named Marty Carson. They would stay together for two years and ultimately split up, but Marty said that he continued to love Lori and he would take care of her. She actually ended up moving just across the street from Marty and they stayed good friends. In 2009, Lori became very ill and it turns out that she was living with undiagnosed hepatitis C, which was spread to her from her mother during childbirth. Her health quickly declined and Marty continued to take care of her. She was eventually placed in hospice care and sadly passed away on November 20th, 2010. Lori's good friend, Barbara Garrier, was later interviewed and she said, quote, I asked Lori once straightforward if she knew who committed that crime. Her answer was like gold to me. I have an idea 
but I would never say it out loud because I would never want anybody to go through what I went through. This is such a sad case and a story of injustice, I believe, a wrongfully convicted person whose life was absolutely destroyed because there's rarely a way to move on from something like that. She said she even tried to get work and people would find out who she was and she would end up getting fired. It's just so sad. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'd love to hear what you think of this case. Please let me know in the comments down below and don't forget to subscribe. Let me know if there's anyone in particular out of this cast of characters that you think is more suspect than another. See you guys next time.